In the past, we have taken a look at computer security before on this channel, but most of the time we've approached the topic from a very technical point of view. Normally what we've done is we've taken a look at one aspect of security and basically we talked about the math or the principles that drives that particular concept. And while that's all well and good, we haven't really taken an overview at what security really is as a whole. So this video is partly by request, partly out of necessity, but what we're gonna do is today, we're gonna approach the general principles of computer security, and then we're gonna move on to some common examples of what a security breach might be like. This also gives me a very convenient way to plug some of my older work, because as we move along in this episode, we will come across some concepts that I have actually explained before. And of course, that will make it easy for me to link to those topics. And if you want to see them in greater depth, you can by clicking the annotation or the card or whatever it is YouTube calls it these days. Anyway, that's pretty much enough of a preamble. Let us jump right into this episode on computer security. Hello and welcome back to another Random Wednesday episode. So before we begin, allow me to give a shout out to the professor who taught me all of this and that is Dr. Liao Wee King from the National University of Singapore. What we're about to see are the four basic principles behind information security. These four principles, which I would consider, you know, things to have if you want a secure system are as follows. Confidentiality, integrity, accessibility, and non-repudiation. Now, some of these terms are kind of self-evident, while some others are not. So let's take it from the top and try to understand what each of them mean. First of all, confidentiality. I think that is pretty self-evident. The idea is if you are making a transmission, you don't want any unauthorized third party to be able to tap into it and to understand its contents. The practical way to achieve this would probably be to use some form of encryption so that even if the information falls into the wrong hands, that person wouldn't be able to make sense out of the information because to them, encrypted information looks like garbled text and they don't have a means to reverse the encryption. Cryptography, particularly the concepts of public and private key cryptography, are things we have looked at before on this channel so I won't go into too much detail at this point. If you want to find out more about this, and well, I do encourage you to do so, there is an annotation link on screen as well as a card. You can click on that to go to that video. It is a pretty long video, which I think, you know, is what is required to do the subject justice. Next up is integrity. And well, the whole idea behind that is when you receive a message from someone, you need to be sure that this message is whole and not modified. In other words, the integrity of the message needs to be intact. You need to know that that is indeed what that person wanted to send you. Practically, what that means is we need some way to know if modifications were made to a particular piece of information, and the way to achieve that is to use some checksum or fingerprints. The whole idea of such an algorithm is that it is a mathematical method that considers all the text inside that transmission. Any little change in the contents of that text will create a huge change in the checksum. And the way we actually use that to guarantee integrity is that the sender needs to compute the checksum of the message. Then both the message and checksum are encrypted and sent. On the receiving end, when the user has received the message, they need to decrypt it and then run the checksum on the contents of the message they'll need to check if the checksum actually matches what was originally sent. If it wasn't, then you know that the message is somehow invalid. We've talked about check digits in the past. It's not really the same thing as checksums, but well, I will link the video anyway because it does sort of encompass the concept of having some kind of calculation that takes all the information contained within the message into account. Next up is availability. As its name implies, we want to be able to guarantee that a piece of data is accessible when required. Now, 
Practically what this means is some form of protection against a denial of service. Denial of service attacks can work in quite a number of ways, but the most common one we see over the internet is to simply flood a server with so much traffic that it cannot respond to legitimate requests. How do you guard against that? Well, it's not an easy problem to solve by any means. What people normally do is they have some kind of load balancing mechanism that is sort of able to take the large volume of data that is coming in. And if it's able to handle that, then maybe the system you know, still has enough resources to respond. Finally, non-repudiation. Now, this one is very interesting. Basically, the idea is the person who has sent the message cannot deny that they are the ones who have sent it. Like what Wikipedia says, this actually sort of transcends the idea of computer security and goes into sort of the legal side of things. But at the same time, we talk about it in this context. And the reason being, well, there are actually computing methods for us to guarantee or at least ensure this to a certain extent. Practically, to achieve non-repudiation, we actually have to include some kind of fingerprint on the side of the sender. Of course, the way we set things up is such that, well, the sender is the only person who could have generated this fingerprint, and as a result, it proves they sent it. So yeah, those were the four principles behind computer security in general. So to quickly summarize, we've taken a look at confidentiality, integrity, availability, and non-repudiation, four fundamental principles behind security. Let us now move on to take a very general look at some common examples of vulnerabilities in systems. By the way, I apologize in advance for turning the remainder of this video into a slideshow. I had originally wanted to take this episode in a different direction, but I realized it would make me overrun horribly. So what you're seeing here was actually cobbled together in editing. Anyway, let's take this list from the top and skim over some of the most common issues a programmer needs to protect their application against. First and foremost is buffer overflow, which happens when you allocate a certain amount of RAM space for a value, but you end up inserting a value too large for that space. As a result, this value spills over out of the allocated space and possibly into areas of RAM that are in use by other applications. This could cause corruption of data, or even worse, if the overwritten area was meant to be executed, you run the risk of executing the input data, which could be malicious code in disguise. The simplest defense against this is to truncate your information to the size of the allocated buffer. That way, it won't spill over. Operating systems also have mechanisms to prevent data areas of memory from being executed as code. In Windows, this is called data execution prevention, and we've covered that before in the past. Next is integer overflow. We've talked about this as well on several occasions, but the idea is numbers are represented as combinations of a finite sequence of bits. If we can make the numbers so large that we overrun the maximum value it can hold, the number basically resets. A malicious user could take advantage of this to make systems behave in undesirable ways. We move on to SQL injection. SQL, which is used to interact with databases, has syntax that is basically just a plain text string. A lot of the time, queries are made based on user input, but the user input should not be directly substituted into the statement, because a malicious user could include SQL logic in their input that ends up getting passed. This one is very interesting, but we don't have the time to go into detail. I'll make an episode of Friday Minis covering this very soon. Next up is cross-site scripting. Web applications that receive and redisplay user input must be careful of this. If a user enters some text containing HTML code, it will get passed when it's displayed on screen. A malicious user could use this to include scripts hosted elsewhere that could possibly compromise security. The solution to this is to escape any code input by the user. In the case of HTML, that will be HTML tags. This stops user input from being executed. We move on to passwords. We could do all we can to protect the security of our database, but we can't guarantee that the passwords held within are safe. This is why, to be safer, we shouldn't store passwords in plain text. If the database gets compromised, the lost passwords could compromise more than one account, 
if the password has been reused on multiple sites. To protect against this, passwords should be cryptographically hashed. We've discussed this before as well, so follow the annotation on screen if you'd like to find out more. Race conditions are an interesting one. Usually, a small period of time elapses between obtaining a permission and actually using it. If something crops up between these two points of time that invalidate the permission, would the user still be able to perform the action, since they've already gotten permission for it beforehand? This is a hard one to tackle, but one good solution is to minimize the time between obtaining and using a permission, which reduces the chances of this happening. Finally, permissions exploits. Generally, a user is allowed to perform certain operations on a system, but not others. A user with malicious intent may try to find ways to give themselves more permissions to access what they are not allowed to. This is not easy to guard against, but staying up to date with software allows you to cover up loopholes that have been discovered so far. So yeah, there you go. Just a very quick crash course on some of the most basics when it comes to computer security in general. We've also moved on to take a look at some examples that are quoted very often, at least in school. So yeah, hopefully this gives you some sort of a comprehensive introduction to computer security in general. Sorry this episode has run a little long, but hopefully it was useful. That's all there is for this episode, thank you very much for watching, and until next time, you're watching 0612 TV. Thank you very much for watching. If you liked this video, consider checking out the rest of my work on my channel. Alternatively, you may be interested in a playlist of my earlier work on computing and computer science topics. If you'd like to show me some monetary support, I am on Patreon. You can find a link to my campaign in the video description. Of course, you can simply like this video or leave a comment. I'll be sure to respond as soon as I can. To keep in touch with my future uploads, do subscribe to this channel. And for even more updates, check out the official Twitter account for this channel at 0612TV. Thank you for your support.